This chaos, this is the birthplace of things. That's why often it's represented as feminine. Because feminine things are the birthplace of things. Now again, you know, people are stuck with the necessity of interpreting their experience through the biological platform of interpretation that they evolved. And so we could say, well, we, we recognize feminine, we recognize masculine, we recognize parent, we recognize child. And that's, that's ancient, right? That's as ancient as mammals. And so those are fundamental social cognitive categories. And we had to exploit those categories to represent the world beyond that when we started to be able to represent the world beyond that. As a, just as a primate, like a, a chimpanzee or a tree-dwelling primate, a complex primate, almost all of their categories are social cognitive. Right? Why? Because they live in complex social environments. And there's a relationship be between the size of the social environment that a primate inhabits and its brain size. The bigger the brain, the larger the environment. And you could think there's a loop there, right? If your brain's too small, you can't handle the larger environment. So the environment grows and it selects for people, for creatures that are complex enough to compute the environment, and then that gives a selective advantage to creatures that are acute or, or, or sharp enough to compute the environment, and so there's more of them, and it loops, and the brain grows. I mean, it's not the only thing driving the evolution of the brain among primates, but it's, it's a primary source. So we have those categories to begin with, and then we have to view the world as it manifests itself outside those primary categories through the lens of those categories. And so what happens is we use the symbolism of, of sex differentiation and the symbolism of parent-child relationships to, to begin to account for the manner in which the world manifests itself. Masculine, why? Well, that's the patriarchy. Chaos, feminine, why? Well, partly it's conceived of in opposition to the patriarchy, but more importantly, it's the thing from which order rises. So it's perfectly reasonable to consider it feminine. And then order again. And then the question is, well, you have order, father, chaos, mother. And then you have this, this transformational process. Well, that's the mythological hero. And those are the three fundamental characters of mythology, individual. Culture, nature, right? It's the universal world. And then that's differentiated further. Positive individual, negative individual, hero and adversary, tyrant and wise king. The destructive element of nature and the creative element of nature. And, and those are perfectly reasonable categories. They, they do a lovely job of actually representing how the world does manifest itself to us in the domains that are permanent. There's always a conscious observer who's ambivalent about the nature of the world. There's always a social structure that's half tyrannical and half order producing. And there's always the nature that gives rise to everything and that destroys it at the same time. Always. It's permanent. And so that's another reason. It's, it's so interesting. That's another reason why the mythological representations are hyper real. Because they, you think, what makes something real? Let's say protons are real. Why? Because at one level of analysis, every single thing is made out of protons. So you can use it as an explanatory tool, the concept. You can use it as an explanatory tool for every possible situation. And it's true across all possible spans of time. Although protons do decay, but it takes billions and billions of years. So real means works now, and works forever, applies now, and applies everywhere. Well, that's exactly what this map means. It's that there's always an observer. There's always a framework of interpretation. And there's always that which is being observed. There's always the, the individual. There's always the social environment, the dominance hierarchy. And there's always the nature that exists outside of that. There's always the knower, the known, and the unknown. Always. So then the question is, well, how do those things interrelate? While well, you differentiate them into their positive and negative elements, because there's always the positive and negative element, and then you tell stories about how the different categories interact. And that's what the stories do. And the more mythological the story, the more that underlying schema is self-evident in the, in, the, in the plot. And you especially see that, I think, in stories for children. And maybe that's because children can't understand stories unless they're archetypal. 
like blatantly archetypal, and that would make sense, right? Because the stories have to appeal to the instinctive knowledge of the child, or the child wouldn't be able to comprehend them. And so, you know, I've, I saw this quite dramatically with my own kids, watching them watch Disney movies, for example. My, my son was absolutely obsessed with Pinocchio, and particularly obsessed with the scene where Pinocchio and, and his father are escaping from the whale, and the whale turns into this sort of smoke belching locomotive thing that's chasing them through the water. He would rewind that and watch it and rewind it and watch it and rewind it and watch it, like over and over and over. And you think, well, what, what the hell's that kid up to? Well, you know, it took us, what, six hours to do a brief run through through Pinocchio still by still. There's a lot of information in that movie, a tremendous amount of information. And then what the kid's trying to do is to incorporate it, to, to understand it, to embody it. And that's all happening in some sense, I would say, unconsciously. It's like it's unconscious in that he couldn't articulate what he was doing, and neither could anyone else. But that doesn't mean he wasn't doing something. He was definitely doing something. He was doing the same thing that enabled my nephew to put on the, the knight suit when he did that, the little knight hat and the sword, and figure out how to go after the great dragon of chaos. And so I want to tell you a little bit more about this idea of chaos. So,